<laughs> I'm Shar. I identify as Shar. <laughs> Anyways, it's good to be here. Saved from a life of crime at the age of five. Grew up in church. Father was a pastor. Grandfather was a pastor. Daddy was a mortician. You know what that is? They're the last man to ever let you down. I always won those contests in school. You know, my daddy's better than your daddy, but you know, I was quick-witted, so I'd always be like, really, yeah? Well, my daddy could like cremate your dad. <laughs> I won, right? I always seemed to also win the grosser than gross contest. Guys were like, okay, we're not playing with her anymore. She's disgusting. Mama, mama had big hair. I don't know if you guys are probably too young to remember big Pentecostal hair. Maybe you've seen images prior. Mama's hair was like so big, you could carry things in it. Seriously, you could like use mama's hair for a backpack when you'd go on a trip. She wouldn't even know things were in there. Uh, and uh, so my sister, she was born, I always felt like my sister was born with a manual. Like she just, she knew how to do everything. She knew how to be ladylike. She knew how to do her hair. She knew how to like boys. I felt like my manual fell out in the mail when I was delivered. It wasn't included. You ever get Ikea furniture home and you're like, wait, they forgot the instructions. Guys were like, what, they come with instructions? <laughs> I felt like my manual fell out in the mail and, 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 and I didn't know how to do my hair and I, I didn't know how to like boys and when I was young I thought I was one. That's a whole nother topic. But I didn't know one thing, I didn't know that I wanted to preach and so I remember in the third grade, my grandfather was a pastor and in the third grade my teacher said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And my hand shot up in the air and I yelled, I want to preach the gospel. And like the whole room fell silent and then we just went to recess and everything changed. <laughs> And so I grew up playing a couple of favorite games that I had when I was a kid. I would sit and I would play paperwork because I was really nerdy, a nerdy kid. And so my mom had these old stamp pads and these stampers with ink. And so I would stamp, you know, like my papers. And some of you probably don't even know it. You could look it up. You could Google it later uh, or jump on Metaverse or something. They probably made some sort of thing for that that shows what stamp pads are. And, and I would... I would stamp and then I would stamp myself and then I would want to stamp other family members and there would be ink everywhere and I just loved it. I loved paperwork. And the other thing I did is I played microphone. I played microphone all the time. Everything was a microphone. A ruler, a pencil, a hairbrush when I brushed my hair. I mean, everything was a microphone. My sister and I would fight and I would say, I can't hear you. And she'd be like, what? What are you talking about? You're not speaking in my microphone. So everything had to be amplified because I love my microphone. But the greatest thing I would do with my microphone is, you guessed it, I would preach. I would line up all of my stuffed animals. I'm sure much like you did when you were a kid. And I would invite Barbie and Ken. I was a little evangelist. And they would come, they, Barbie and Ken would come to the church service. And then at the end, I would give an altar call, hoping that um, I was really only preaching to Barbie and Ken because I wanted them to come forward because you know what? I knew what they'd been doing. <laughs> I'm just saying. You like Jesus saw you Saturday night in the Barbie car and now you're at the church in church on Sunday. All right? Okay. But I remember at the age of 13, I had a call to ministry. I was at summer camp, and of course, I was convinced that I was going to be a missionary to Africa. And this is what life was supposed to look like. After graduation, I would toss off my cap and gown. My parents would be there crying. My mother would mouth, you're my favorite, in earshot of my sister. And... Um, there would be a tarmac there with a plane and I would, I would tell everybody goodbye. I was going to spread the gospel and I would get on the plane. We would fly all night and after we got over the jungles of Africa, the green light would come on. I would put on my parachute and I would link up. I don't even know what this stuff is. I've watched way too many movies. The doors were op would open as we got over the jungles of Africa. People on the plane would be crying, Shar, go with God. <laughs> Deep spiritual moments. And as I would fly out of the airplane, like, my shadow would fall and, and people that were like in wheelchairs would, would like start to walk again. Like people in the jungles of Africa would be like, what is that? I, it's Char, I can walk. It's Char, I can walk. 
And, and then I wouldn't like learn the language. I wouldn't go to language school. I would just speak in tongues and people would get saved. I, I wouldn't have to do any of the things that missionaries would have to do. I would just, this was all my fantasy and all my dream of how life was going to turn out. And then after my grad party, I woke up and I looked in the mirror and I thought, oh yeah, that's right. I signed up for community college. So maybe you're in this room, and just like me, you have some incredible dreams of what life's going to be look what what life's going to look like. You know, you're going to be a teacher, a psychologist, Elon Musk, incredible thought leader, Blippi, uh, a commercial airline pilot. You're going to be Jeff Bezos. You have a dream, and you have a plan. And then there's the rest of you in this room, and you're just as lost as an Easter egg when it comes to what you're going to end up doing. And that's okay. That's all right. Because this is so true. If you know what you want to be, your do will follow. Huh. I just knew I wanted to be a woman of God. I wanted to be a woman of character. I wanted to be like Jesus. I wanted to be a leader worth following. And I wanted to be a servant. Erwin McManus says this. He says that serving acts as a compass in the midst of of the fog. So you don't know what you want to do? Just get in there and serve. Man, I'm telling you, I just jumped in and I just started serving in the kingdom of God. And then, you know, you serve in, your, in the nursery and you're like, yep, that's not it. <laughs> right? Praise God. Don't you love those little nuggets? They're great. But right now in our society, I believe we are facing a leadership crisis. I work for an organization that oversees 450 churches and 1,500 ministers in Northern California and Nevada. I get the pleasure, the pleasure of overseeing youth ministries, young adult ministries, and kids ministries in these churches. And it cracks me up, and I love it. God has such a sense of humor. I don't even have kids. I've spent my life raising small dogs. But God has a plan for my life. <laughs> We used to see for years, we saw young people who were on waiting lists because they could not wait to serve in the church. They couldn't wait to be a youth pastor. They couldn't wait to be a children's pastor. But sadly, those lists have dried up. See, you don't make a lot of money, money in ministry. I hate to point that out. There's no salary really waiting on you after you graduate Bible college, but you will eat a lot of celery. <laughs> you see what I did there? You see what I did? Thank you. Thank you for that. I know it's early. I know it's early. I'm this annoying alarm clock, but that's okay, because I'm dope. <laughs> but in Judges 2.10, I read a scripture, and it makes me want to weep, because I worry that we're on the cusp of this. It says, after that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. We're seeing a leadership crisis, my friends. Barna, don't we love this guy? He's full of, always full of good news. He said this, more than 4,000 churches closed in America in 2020. Over the same time, over 20,000 pastors left the ministry and 50% of current pastors say they would leave the ministry if they had another way of making a living. Crisis in leadership, it's not a new thing. Remember my friend, there's nothing new under the sun. I used to come home and I would tell my mom big news and she would look at me and she'd say, honey, there's nothing new under the sun. You know that's in the Bible. I'd be like, man, you always spoil my news. I thought this was about me. Mom, give me a trigger warning next time. But we see in the book of Judges that Gideon has died and Israel is needing a new leader. And his son Abimelech comes to, comes to everybody and he says, hey, you guys, because remember everybody in the Bible was related at that point, I think. <laughs> and he says, <laughs> he says, hey, you guys know me. We're family. You know, you see me at the family reunion. I wear one of the t-shirts we all get together. And um, I think I should be uh, the next king. And they're like, yeah, that's true. We do know you. And they're like, okay, yeah, you can, you can do it. You can do it. Then he says, okay, all right, I'll do it. And so the first thing he does when he becomes king, uh, when, they anoint, when, they have him, when they appoint him as king there in uh, Shechem, is he goes and he gets all 70 of his half-brothers together, and he doesn't throw a party, he kills them. 
He, he has this bright idea. I, I want to say narcissist much. You know, he's like, I'm just going to get rid of the competition. That's it. He, he was kind of like Oprah with death. And you get to die, and you get to die, and you get to die, right? And so all of a sudden, though, one of the brothers escapes, and his name was Jotham. And he runs up to the top of the mountain. And in Judges 9, we see he says this, that when Joseph heard about this, he climbed to the top of the mountain. And he says, listen to me, citizens of Shechem. Listen to me if you want God to listen to you. Whoa, that's heavy. Once upon a time, the trees decided to choose a king. And first they said to the olive tree, be our king. But the olive tree refused, saying, should I quit producing the olive oil that blesses both God and people just to wave back and forth over the trees? And then they said to the fig tree, you come be our king. But the fig tree refused, saying, should I quit producing my sweet fruit just to wave back and forth over the trees? And then they said to the grapevine, you be our king. But the grapevine also refused, saying, should I quit producing the wine that cheers both God and people just to wave back and forth over the trees? And then all the trees finally turned to the thorn bush, and they said, come be our king. And the thorn bush replied to the trees, if you truly want me to make me your king, come and take shelter in my shade. If not, let fire come out from me and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Right now, I feel like I'm, on jo I'm Jotham on top of a mountain, that we're at DEFCON 1 in regard to Christ of leadership in the body of Christ. The olive tree knew it was created to produce olives. It didn't have time to watch over the other trees. The same with the fig tree. It stayed in its lane. It told its truth. It was living its life. I want to propose today that we don't delegate leadership in the body of Christ to the thorn bush. Nobody grows under the shade of a thorn bush. I think it's wonderful if you're here today and you know what type of tree you are. You're like, hey, Char, I'm an olive tree. I produce olives. It's my lane. I love good olives. Put them all on my fingers. Good to eat. Maybe you're here, you're like, I'm a fig tree, man. I just can't wait to, I just produce figs. I'm all up in the figs. Maybe you're here and you're like, I'm the grapevine and everybody loves me. <laughs> no, you don't. I can't be a leader in the body of Christ. I don't, have a I don't have time. I'm producing figs. I'm making wine. I'm up in the olives. It's not my gift. Back when I was in church, we would have this little phrase. We would say, I don't feel led. We made it spiritual. But see, there's some things in your life you can't delegate. You can't delegate brushing your teeth or taking a shower. Thank God. You can't hire someone to do your devotions and get closer to God for you. Hey, you, I'm going to pay you. You cry out to God, and it's going to save my soul. You can't go to a counselor and say, hey, you know, I'm going to pay you. You know, counsel my mother, and I'm going to get better. <laughs> Believe me, I tried. <laughs> you can't delegate your responsibility to share your Jesus story with the next generation. You can't do it. It's your story. Tell your story. We have to hear your story. This generation has to hear from you how you found Jesus, how he kept you, and how he's shown you his love. I'll start with mine, and then we'll go around the room. Oh, just kidding. We'd be here all day. For years, see, I, I thought my story would disqualify me for ministry from the call that was on my life because at the age of 10, I just knew I was different. I went to my mom when I was 16, big Pentecostal hair mama, raised in the church. I mean, if a kissing scene even came on the channel, on the TV, we had to change the channel. For years, I was like, what happens? <laughs> I never got married because the channel changed. <laughs> I was like, we changed the channel. I went to my mom, I was 16, and I said, Mom, I think I'm gay. Whew. I didn't know what she was going to do. I was expecting the exorcist. I thought her head was going to spin around. I, I didn't know. And I'll never forget, my mom said to me, she said, you've been watching way too much television. I want to be like, what? We're constantly changing the channel. I, I don't even know what's on. This is back when nobody talked about that kind of stuff. This was back in the 90s. We were doing other things. <laughs> Making great music. <clears throat> And so I convinced myself that I would just keep my secret and I would take it my, to my grave. And then when times got really, really rough and it was really depressed, I would have this little voice that would say, you know what, you probably should just kill yourself. That's the only way you're going to be free. I would, heal that. I would hear that from time to time. 
funny though how when you get to college you find a safe place and you begin to open up and God put a college pastor and his wife in my life and they begin to love on me and tell me I didn't have to live in secret anymore. I could be who I was in Jesus and I could be open and honest and authentic in my relationship with the Lord and honest where I was in my sexuality. And I had to wrestle with the realization that my sexuality and my faith collided and they didn't agree. Eventually, my friend, your faith is going to collide with something in your life. It might not be your sexuality. It might be your vocation. It might be your politics. Good God knows our faith collides with all sorts of political things. But your decision on how you're going to handle that will greatly impact your Jesus story. Man, it's quiet in here. Maybe it's just me. People back in those days, though, tried to give me tons of advice. I'll never forget. People didn't know how to handle people like me. Some of them still don't. They were like, well, Shar, you should grow your hair out. One person was like, Shar, you should like, sell your truck so that you can stop working on it. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, well, I'll grow my hair out, but then I'm going to have to hitchhike. I think that's unsafe. Or maybe I'll meet a man. I, I didn't know. I was like, is this how I'm supposed to? We changed the channel. I didn't know. What am I supposed to do? And so while people were trying to change me on the outside, Jesus was like, oh, no, 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 hon, I love you. I love your hair. Work on your truck. I'm worried about the inside. And I finally decided that instead of pursuing heterosexuality, that I, you know, was going to be the the best, that some altar call was going to cure me and I was going to be the most heterosexual feminine female you could ever find, I realized that instead of pursuing heterosexuality, I just wanted to pursue uh, holiness. And then I realized that in the Bible that homosexuality was listed next to a whole bunch of other sins. And so I just thought, well, okay, I'm not, I don't want to do those either. So, hey, I guess, you know, I'm just going to walk in holiness. And I know right now I'm probably super offending a lot of you, but that's okay. It's not really me. It's the word of God. I prayed. I just said, Lord Jesus, help me to offend as many people as possible today with the word. <laughs> right. So much like Paul, I was given this thorn. Well, I, I actually call it a gift. But see, it's a gift that humbles me, but it doesn't humiliate me. No worries. God has a humbling gift for you, too. He he passes them out readily. He's real good at that. And I soon realized that the thing that would disqualify me, I thought, from ministry was the thing that qualified me because it made me uniquely useful. And in 2005, I started a ministry for young people called Unspoken, helping them who were struggling with their sexuality so they didn't have to face it alone. So no no young person in the church ever had to say, well, I think the only way out is to kill myself. No, no, baby. Come on. I'm here with you. I'll stand with you. I understand. See, Jesus sees the heart of those who don't fit. The church had a problem with me because I wasn't all better. (laughs) I I didn't end up married with four kids. I don't know, for some reason, that's always like the gold standard. That's what I thought in my mind. And then the LGTBQAI community, LMNOP, they, they, sorry. They had a problem with me because I believed homosexuality was a sin and I lived a celibate life. Yeah, they, they didn't like that option. They had a problem with me on a regular basis. But the only person who didn't have a problem with me was Jesus. He loves my story. He loves my Jesus story. And I don't know what your story is. But future generations got to hear your story. Listen to me. Some of you in this room have a call on your life, and it is so deep, and it's been chasing you around. And he's been after you, and you've been trying to, like, negotiate. (laughs) Right? You've been like, okay, well, you know, okay, uh, well, how can I do ministry as a side hustle? Because, I, I, you know, I I got to have a backup plan. You sense or you know that God is even calling you to be a senior pastor or a missionary or youth pastor, a kids pastor, or a worship leader. And you're even at the point where you've really felt like you've lost your peace because you've been wrestling with this thing. I, I know I'm not talking to everybody in this room. But you're here and you, you've just been wrestling with this thing. God, what do I do? And you're trying to convince yourself of this backup plan. You've got this thing all in place. But I want to remind you this morning that surrender equals peace. And I know that it seems like people are jumping out of ministry like rats off a sinking ship. But listen to this. Leaders rush in when everybody else rushes out. 
We have to have a generation that rushes in and says, you know what? I'm going to share my Jesus story. And I don't want to do anything right now in my life that's going to disqualify me from the call. I had it. There were so many other things I wanted to do. My dad had a lucrative business. I mean, burying people ain't cheap. And he came to me and he said, hey, baby, uh, do you want to go into the business? Man, I saw my own a beautiful home. You know, you start dreaming. You're like, what kind of car do I want to buy? Oh, all these things. And your eyes start lighting up because we like shiny things. And so I started this wrestling match with God. Well, God, I, I, I could just, I could go over here and I, I could be, you know, I could become a mortician. I know it's awkward, but I'm already awkward. So I fit in the category and, and, and I could make money and I could have a backup plan. And then, you know, Lord, if, if then I, you know, and God was like, wait, no. Char, what do you want to be when you grow up? That little hand. I want to preach the gospel. It's like a fire and it's shut up in your bones. And for some of you in here, you're like, I, I don't even know what this thing is, but it, 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 it comes at me and I, I, I don't even know what to put in words. But if you could read my journal, that's my heart, is I want to share the gospel with the next generation. My friend, listen to this, and I end with this. The highest compliment one can ever have is to be tapped on the shoulder by God. Nine times out of ten, he does that when we're very young. I'm going to ask you this morning, if you'd just mind closing your eyes and bowing your head. We have to hear your story. We have to hear your Jesus story. Lord, help us in all of our busyness. And all of our importance is olive trees and fig trees and grape vines. That while we may have important things to do in this life, and we're getting incredible degrees that will lead to phenomenal titles, that no matter where we end up in the marketplace, that our Jesus story takes priority. God, let it not be said on another generation on our watch that another generation grew up who didn't acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things that he'd done. May we be a generation that reminds our brothers and sisters and our cousins and our nieces and our nephews and future generations about the goodness of God. And now with uh, all of our heads bowed, I... I just want to ask if you're here this morning and you say, Shar, I know I have a call to ministry, to full-time ministry, that God is calling me to be a pastor, to be a missionary, to be a youth pastor. He has tapped me on the shoulder. I know it's a different category, and I'm not trying to say one is greater than the other, but if that's you this morning, would you just acknowledge by just raising your hand or just waving at me, Shar, that's... I have, this, I have this incredible call on my life and I carry it around. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I want to pray specifically for you today. Lord, I understand the burden of walking around night and day carrying the call that will soon be birthed into a ministry. I remember what it was like as a young person, God. I pray right now that you would give my brothers and sisters the strength that they need, Lord, in a season where leaders are rushing out, Lord, they are preparing themselves to rush in. God, for those young people in this room who never even gave it a second thought, I ask that today when they go back to their dorm or they get in their car, that Jesus, they would ask you, Lord, what is it you want to do with my life? This is my plan. What is your plan for me? God, are you tapping me on the shoulder too? I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen.